Robin Hood and Little John walking through the forest, laughing back and forth at what the other has to say. Reminiscing this and that and having such a good time. Oodle lolly, oodle lolly, golly, what a day. Hello, hello, once again out in Podland. I am Rod O'Reilly. And I'm Mark Merlino. And we are collectively known as Two Old Furry Fans. Uh, welcome back once again. Um, many, many thanks to our buddy Chango Lion for getting our website set up and getting the first podcast out to the world for you. So hopefully much sooner this time, we are back with another episode, looking back at some of the places that uh, furry fandom has been over the decades, mostly through the lens of our own two lives, because we've been there for a lot of it, folks. With your kind permission, Cy, um, we spent a lot on the last episode going over some of your background, because as I pointed out then, you've been around longer than I have. Uh, So uh, just to get people back up to speed, uh, let me do a quick uh, rundown of where the heck I came from uh, and all of this, since we sort of wound up in the middle of the 60s or getting into the late 60s, which is when I came about. Uh, I was born in 1964 in Los Angeles, California, so late in the year it might as well have been 1965. My hospital where I was born has since been turned into a Scientology center, which probably says something about the weirdness I was destined for. Interesting, you you brought up last time about uh, all the movies that you remember back from your earliest days. My uh, parents didn't really believe in movie theaters. Um, My dad was an electrician by trade, but he was a razor of, a razor of, he raised racehorses by choice. And so we spent a lot of my uh, early growing years moving around from ranch to ranch. And so I had a completely different reason for moving around like you did. And um, in between those times, we would bounce back up for the summers, usually to Canada, to Vancouver, British Columbia, which is where my parents are both from. Uh, So I wound up knowing Vancouver almost as well as I know um, Southern California. And um, uh, my father, among his many other interesting things, didn't really like movie theaters. They made him kind of claustrophobic. He much, much preferred drive-ins, which were all the rage in the uh, 60s and 70s, as you may recall. And um, so I didn't really, uh, we, we, we didn't go to movies unless they were something specifically that my dad was in because he owned the truck. Um, so my first parts that I remember getting into um, media and stuff like that was all television. Um, specifically in the late 60s. Uh, I already mentioned last time that, uh, you know, I saw, when I was very, very young, I saw the first uh, screenings of Amazing 3, and that was like, wow. Um, And then later on came Kimba, and that really grabbed me. About what year was was it that you remember Amazing 3 from? Oh, boy, boy. Uh, The first couple of years of my life, so it had to be like... uh, 67, early 67. Around. Can you remember where you watched it? What channel? No, no, not at all. Uh, I, I know that uh, most of the cartoons were on like uh, KTTV Channel 11 and uh, whatever was Channel 13 at the time. But uh, no, they, they all just kind of blended together at that point. I, I had no idea what I was watching um, in terms of stuff and I had to ask my parents to change the channels anyway. I do know that uh, Kimba was good old Channel 52. Uh, it was the first thing I ever yeah, saw. Yeah, well, that was reruns. Right, right. Kimba was actually an Astro Boy. Both of the Tezka early shows were shown in what was considered prime time for animation when they came out. Wow. So they were on the major networks. They were on ABC. Really? And then later on, they ended up in, you know, syndication forever. Right, right. Uh, For some reason, probably because Kimba came along, Astro Boy was pulled from syndication, possibly because there was a limit Mm -hmm. to licensing. Right. Which is the reason why, in order to actually have episodes to watch after the CFO got started, 
we had to rely on reel-to-reel videotapes, half-inch reel-to-reel videotapes right. that had been recorded by Robin Lydon mm-hmm. when he was in the South right. working on a uh, project that's become rather notorious, Sid and Marty Croftland. Oh, my goodness. Um, and it turned out that a station there was conti- was running Astro Boy in syndication, and he recorded it, and then later we were able to get a machine working miraculously because it was so old. Right. And dupe them over to three-quarter inch pneumatic. Oh, how modern and high-tech. That's the first Astro Boys we could actually show people at the CFO meetings, and out in this state... After Kimba had his run mm-hmm. in the afternoon prime spot, right. by the time you came along, it was showing on Channel 52, which was one of the UHF stations right. um, that just, they just showed whatever they could get a hold, get their hands on. Right. And for them, that was kind of a prime thing. And I had, at that point, I had actually purchased my first video cassette recorder, which was a Sanyo V-Cord 2. Right. And the, one of the first things I did with it when I discovered that show was on is I recorded it. It was also on in the afternoons. Mm-hmm. So I would actually be recording it at work at Quisonic, my speaker company. I actually had the setup in what was my lab. I'd go in there every afternoon and record an episode. Good grief. So so this is getting into the 70s then? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. So, this, yeah, that, that was later syndication. Yeah. Um, I, was, I have a feeling if you saw Kimba before that, it really wasn't on 52. It's fully possible. Yeah. It's hard for me to, hard for me to say. Cause... There are a lot. I mean, UHF channels were really an unusual thing then. Hmm. Even though they were all over the country, there was a few places in the country, like San Diego, where the UHF channels were actually major networks ah. because they couldn't get a hold of a channel that was already taken by somebody. Right. And the low-frequency channels, the, the VHF channels, because they could broadcast so far, mm-hmm. you couldn't have adjacent channels even at a 100-mile range. Ah, okay. So you couldn't have, you know, the channel... You know, two and four and uh, two, four and five, for example. If you had channel two, four and five in Los Angeles, which you did, you couldn't have those in San Diego. Mm. Be interference. Right. Wow. So ABC ended up on channel thirty-four. Really. In San Diego. Wow. But for the most part, people didn't even know what that second dial on the television was for. <laughs> Oh, my parents showed me, and we went crazy because there was lots. As you said, since they were grabbing everything they could get a hold of, the UHF channels just had everything crazy. It's just like nowadays, very few people know about broadcast digital television because the cable and satellite people have tried to bury the fact that it exists. Right. But I, one of the things I did back then is I made little uh, UHF antennas out of cardboard and coat hangers mm-hmm. that people could hang on their wall behind the TV so they could watch Kimba. <laughs> well, I'll warn people that, uh, boy, uh, as the 60s go along, uh, animation and uh, other things of note in the media start getting really interesting. So uh, the, the have you heard ofs are going to come very fast and furious in this episode, such as towards the end of the 60s, among like everything else in the world, uh, animation started getting psychedelic. Psychedelic. And we wound up with things like uh, Catanooga Cats, which was, you know, very furry for its time because they were, you know, not just animal things. They were anthropomorphic on TV doing a rock band, which, you know, wow for me. And that, of course, was a good old De Patty Freeling, which is to say uh, the finance guy, Mr. DePatty and the uh, creative guy for his Freeling from Warner Brothers, uh, which I believe first started getting going around the mid-60s with our buddy the Pink Panther. Then uh, also DePatty Freeling and even stranger than the Catanooga Cats was this thing called Here Comes the Grumpf, which was a fantasy series and 
it just was so off the wall in terms of everything about the backgrounds and the characters and all this stuff. It was, you know, just simple fantasy story, you know, a young guy and young girl uh, running away from an evil wizard and his dragon, known as the Grumpf. But the everything about it was just, I didn't even remember until it started coming out on DVD recently just how weird it was. That wasn't the boy, like, from... Our world? Yes, he was. Yes. And the girl was from the fantasy world? Yes. Are you aware of what that series was based off of? Not in the slightest. An Academy Award winning short subject cartoon in the short subject thing. A lot Back in the day when theatrical cartoons were still being made, mm-hmm. many of them ended up getting nominated for animated short subject. Mm-hmm. And one of the winners was Frizz Freeling's Yosemite Sam in Medieval Times. Oh, okay. With the dragon. Right. And Here Comes the Grump was basically him taking the same joke Mm -hmm. of the dragon and the hot-headed person Mm -hmm. trying to control him without stepping on Warner Brothers' toes. Stupid dragon. Yes, yeah. I remember that. The, the dragon would sneeze and end up burning the wizard, and that was the same joke as the... that was in the cartoon, except it was Yosemite Sam in an armor. Right. Uh... We were talking about psychedelia. Oh, yes. Which uh, Catanooga Cats is known for. Yes. Which is why the song sequences from Catanooga Cats have shown up all over the place as fillers. Yes. And also, uh, it should be mentioned that the uh, this was right the period when suddenly Fantasia became a moneymaker, which it had never been up to that point because they, they were doing their seven-year cycle thing, and they re-released it, and it uh, came out right in the middle of but either 67 or 68. And, uh, of course, the hippies went, wow, man. So... That was the first time when, uh, you know, a couple of years after Walt Disney passes away, his favorite film suddenly becomes a moneymaker. Ouch. It's interesting because one of the releases of that was specifically targeted at college students. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. And that happened to be when I was going to Fullerton College. Ah, cool. And there was a class called Observational Astronomy, Ah. which ran from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., Makes sense. So I would finish my classes in the afternoon, study in the library till about five, go have dinner at Coco's, and then go to the Fullerton Cal State University Fullerton Theater and see Fantasia. Mm -hmm. I did it about six or eight times. (laughs) Nice. And it was really funny because most of the audience were college students, and many of them had been basically given seeing the film as a class assignment. Oh. So the music department and a lot of the art department Mm -hmm. were going to see that film. And so many times I would be sitting in the audience. It wasn't really a a packed house at that time of the day on a weekday. Right. But pretty much everybody there was a college student. Nice. And many of them had never seen the film before. Uh Uh-huh. And listening to the comments was amazing. <laughs> uh, usually, the the first, if you've seen Fantasia, you know the first sequence is pretty much... Abstract. It's very abstract. It's moving colors and shapes to Takata and Fugue. Right. And people would get lost with that. They didn't know what they were watching. Yeah, the first time I went to go see it, I was, you know, very young uh, in the 80s. and But, you know, that that whole sequence was kind of, what was this for? I mean, I learned to appreciate it later, but at the time it was kind of fidget, fidget. But once they got into the more solid story and characters, the uh, off-color comments went away. Mm-hmm. And you just heard people ooing and aahing and just you know quietly watching the film Mm -hmm. and pretty much by the end of the movie they converted another theater full of people right um but yeah i have a mini poster from that release and it looks like something you'd see hanging in a hippie's den under black light as a matter of fact it glows under black light exactly they were really pushing it as a, a trip it was not just a movie but it was a trip 
Mm-hmm. And it worked. Yeah. It, it absolutely worked. Interesting that, also, again, carrying on with the psychedelic line, uh, around this time was when uh, I first started seeing Gumby. <sighs> And, uh, you know... Art Cloakie was crazy. Yes, Art Cloakie. You know, that's the thing about a lot of the stuff from the 60s is that, uh, you know, the people look at this and say, well, obviously the makers were on drugs. I can let you know that Mark and I have met some of the makers, and they weren't on drugs. They probably should have been, because they were just flipping nuts. <laughs> And, and it, it, it's a funny little little side thing, but, um, you know, my dad was started explaining to me one time about you know, what animation is. And he said, well, they take a bunch of drawings, then they, the drawings are each different, and they put them together in a sequence, and then it looks like it's moving. And I said, okay, fine. And, and then he said, and you know, Gumby is, is animation too. And I look at Gumby, and I'm thinking, that's a bunch of drawings? I look at him like, like the hell you say? <laughs> he didn't explain to me about stop motion. He just said right. it was drawings. So that was very, very hard for me to wrap my brain around. Uh, figured it out eventually, but uh, yeah, no, I I, I adored that again. Taking you know, t- simple little stories and going off into very 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 weird places with it, and yeah, well, we've met the the creator Art Cloakey, and he was he was quite a character. It's it's interesting because a town called Panic, which is a hilarious movie, yes, and the series of shorts based on the same characters owes a lot to Gumby. Oh, yeah. It really does. I mean, it's like, I don't think it would exist if some of the people involved had not seen Cloakie's work. Yeah, well, unlike a lot of, unlike a lot of uh, stop motion of the time, especially clay work, uh, the characters were very solid in uh, in Cloakie's work. They didn't really mush and and, and squ- other, other than Goo, who that was her entire point. But, uh, you know, Gumby and Pokey and Prickle, um, who, by the way, was my favorite character, were very solid and kind of, uh, you know, it th- things were not, you know, mushy and, and squishing around and stuff like that. So it, the, it, it, it was a very believable world, especially when you were that age. And speaking of stop motion, I guess we should mention that, uh, you know, the latter half of the 60s, Rankin Bass got busy with their uh, Christmas specials, starting off with uh, Rudolph the same year that uh, I came about, 1964 Christmas, which I'm very proud of to uh, have shared the world the same amount of time as him. But uh, they had a bunch of them, and again, so that... You know, the, the, and 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 the, the sad thing was, is this was you know before any of us had recorders, so you know you saw a special around Christmas, and you'd have to wait and hope that next year they would show at the same time because there was nothing else you could do. So it just went without for a year. But what was the studio that there there was a there's a famous Japanese studio that actually did all that for them. Do you know who that was? That was all done by Toei. Oh, Toei had a stop motion division. Mm-hmm. As I recall, Rankin Bass had some design work done in this country, Mm -hmm. and then they basically sent it to Japan to see if they could do it, Mm -hmm. and were very impressed with it. For a long time, they were kind of the only stop-motion production seen in this country. Mm -hmm. Other than Gumby. Yeah. Um, It's funny, the Gumby I remember, Mm -hmm. because I really remember watching Gumby. Mm Mm-hmm. Wasn't the later ones with Prickle and Goo. Right. But they were the ones where uh, Gumby and Pokey were wandering around, essentially, in a room full of toys. Right. I remember those, too. And, you know, in my mind, I I cannot forget, because I was very much into space and things when I was that age. Mm -hmm. They went to the moon on the ladder of a toy fire truck. (laughs) And it was really surreal because they, of course, the ladder just extended and extended and just kept extending until they got all the way to the moon. And essentially, they climbed up the ladder and then onto the surface of the moon. They were upside down and they had to like walk around the planet mm-hmm. around the surface of the moon before they were right side up. Right. And the fact of them climbing all the way to the moon really scared me when I was a kid. <laughs> Actually, what I remember is one where they more did more traditionally, they were sending up a rocket, and uh, they had one of the goofiest jokes I've ever seen. It took me years to get it, but, um, you know, they're, they're, they're setting up the rocket, and they pass by a big tank that says, fuel, and then they uh, pass by a second tank that's liquid oxygen, and it says, locks, 
and then they pass by a bunch of boxes that say bagels. Yes. <laughs> That's Art Cloakley, all right. <laughs> so, um, oh, and yeah, uh, go, taking it back to uh, Rankin Bass, um, again, late 60s, uh, suddenly we get this absolute weirdness known as Mad Monster Party, which totally caught my attention because even back then I was a closet, you know, classic monsters fan um and uh had most one of the most interesting werewolf designs he was sort of a psychedelic or, or sort of a sort of a, a, a hippie gypsy werewolf who looked more like a were bobcat with a big earring and uh, i i just adored that thing i didn't even realize again until seeing it years later just how adult for rank and bass that thing was in fact it was even more adult than we knew because there were scenes they cut out when they showed it in syndication on tv because they were too kinky yes they that was that was a theatrical feature Mm -hmm. that was not done for television right and with the cast they had they had intended adults to watch it Mm -hmm. so it was a it was a broad spectrum film uh there were Fantasy and fam, well, I guess you'd call it family, big blockbuster films that were, you know, had a cast that adults would want to see, mm-hmm. but the action in it wasn't considered something that a child would upset a child. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Great Race, for example. Oh, yeah. I went crazy for that film, although more for the gadgets than, I mean, there was nothing furry about it, really. Yeah. Now, that's another one that, um, you know, I I never saw in the theater, but was by the time I started getting into things, uh, late 60s, early 70s, was being shown ridiculously over and over and over again, usually on KTLA Channel 5, Hello Los Angeles. And, you know, that was, you know, my dad introduced me to that one because he loved the film and I immediately fell in love with it. And it was always a big thing. Oh, they're showing it again. Let's all sit down and watch it. So we, I saw that, you know, five times a year in, in the early 70s. So I really, now again, that was a cut version, not for kinkiness for this time, just for time. They cut out several of the song sequences. So I never saw half of the songs in it until I was much, much older, which is too bad because they're wonderful. But, you know, it's already a three-hour film, so. That was a three-hour film? I think when, I think uncut, yes. Or it would have, put it to you this way, if they'd inserted commercials. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. Of course, you know, that there there is a, you know, restored DVD available now. Oh, which we have. Yes. Yeah, so I was, you know, Mr. Television guy, um, moving around with my with my parents. I... You know, was the geeky kid. Um, I was the weird kid. Didn't wasn't necessarily the one that other people wanted to hang around with. So I spent a lot of time alone with my own head, and pieces of paper and pencils. And I started sketching pretty early on. Um, back then, I was too crazy and silly and young to know that uh, what I was drawing wasn't the greatest stuff in the world. But I drew a lot of it. Um, didn't draw people much, but I drew lots and lots of stuff, because just like you, I was into gadgets. I loved uh, bridges, I loved buildings, I loved airplanes, I loved airports. Um, I absolutely adored fairgrounds, uh, midways, and stuff like that. Not even I didn't like riding on all the rides, but I loved the way they moved. I loved kind of the, 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 the motion geometry of the way they came up with ways to fling people around in all directions. So I drew lots and lots and lots of that stuff. And uh, pretty much that's the way it stayed until the early 1970s, which I didn't realize at the time what a big event it was, but uh, we actually convinced my dad to take us to a a sit-down theater in Riverside, California, and that's the first time I ever saw Disney's Robin Hood. And oh my God. (laughs) <laughs> I, I remember seeing Robin Hood. Of course, I was much older then. But my excuse for seeing all this stuff and watching all this stuff was I was an animation fan. Mm-hmm. And I was an animation fan since I was a child, mm-hmm. a young child. I was going through 
digging up things based on some notes that Rodney took, and I remembered Goliath II. Oh, yes. And that was one of the few things that ended up being shown on Warner World of Color, the Disney right. show. They didn't show a lot of animation, and it was really upsetting to me because I. That was too bad. They showed Goliath II, and I fell in love with it. And that was the first show that I I dug up everything I could on it. And I eventually got the picture album, which was basically a record that had, it's called a Magic Mirror. Mm-hmm. It had a, a clear window in the album. It had a piece of artwork, and you open it up, and there was a little booklet. Mm-hmm. So I actually could see drawings from the show. And I'd made my first animation cell Ooh. of Goliath the Second. Nice. No idea what happened to it, but th- I wanted to do a cell. I knew what cells were. They actually would sell them at Disneyland for like six bucks. You could buy a cell from one of their productions. Mm-hmm. Usually the TV stuff that they were doing for Wonderful World of Color, not the features. But I actually had a cell from Sword in the Stone that I bought at Disneyland. Ooh. Because they, you know, lots of cells in the movie, and they go, oh, we'll just, you know, stick them on a, on a printed background and sell them because, you know, we're not going to use them again. That's true. And, well, this is before uh, animation collecting became a big thing. Yes. And uh, we probably should uh, give a Hail Mary at some point to Mr. Dave Smith. Right. Um, Because, you know, before he came along, nobody at Disney, including Disney himself, even thought of archiving stuff from the movies they'd created and, you know, making a a big deal out of the collections. And he came along and said, why don't you do this? And I think that's when Disney said, fine, you're the archivist. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much that I was putting together an art show. This is in 1975. Right. That was that was Cal Poly, right? Yeah. That was at Cal Poly. They had just built a student union. There was a lot of controversy about building a student union for a school where 90% of the people commuted. <laughs> but they decided to do it. And the way they did it is they got a guy, uh, his name was Hal Roach, not the famous Hal Roach, but uh, a different kind of famous Hal Roach. Yes. Um, who was an administrator who actually figured out a way to get students and other projects together to make money to raise to build the student union and one of the things it had was a great big art gallery right and since they weren't going to actually have the official opening until the next year the gallery was sitting empty and i took one of my cells from ricky tiki tavi into mr roach's office and i showed it to him and he was amazed he'd never seen an animation cell before Ah. And I said, if you want, I will fill that art gallery with this kind of art for graduation. And he said, go for it. So I had very few classes my last year. I drove all over Southern California, visited all the studios, met all the famous people, because they weren't famous then. People like? Chuck Jones, Frizz, you know, Al, Isidore Frizz Freeling. Mm-hmm. Tex Avery, Bob Clampett, Walter Lance. I actually sat in their offices and talked to them. Abe Levito? Abe Levito. And I collected artwork. Didn't you also uh, chat it up with Bill Melendez? Yes. Okay. He actually, some of the people had artwork they could give me. Most of them didn't. They left Warner Brothers and the artwork was all destroyed. Right. But some of them had snuck them at home. Yes. Uh, sadly, most of Tex Avery's collection was lost uh, in a basement flood. Oh. And uh, the same thing happened to a lot of Bob Clampett's collection. Oh. But I ended up with about 500 pieces of artwork, which I had to cleverly figure out a way to put on 36 panels. <laughs> And my friend Lori Manley helped me with that. That's the famous uh, multi-panel single frame thing, right? Yes. Which we, we should had. put pictures up on our website because that's an amazing thing that uh, Mark and his buddy invented of uh, how to do like up to four or five animation cells on a single frame. 
such that it looks like they belong that way. They wind up with something that's about four foot by four foot. Since most of the artwork I was getting wasn't even matted, right? Um, I came up with the crazy idea of just putting the artwork up with push pins. Mm -hmm. So the whole effect was you were in this giant studio that made every animation you could think of, <laughs> and it was, you know, in production. So you're walking around, it looked like everything was a storyboard. Did any of the famous people manage to make it down and see the display? Yes. Um, I threw uh, Carl Bell, which uh, is a name you probably haven't heard of, but he was really, uh, he was a Disney animator. Mm -hmm. And he ended up working for... UPA for a while, and he was a friend and, and confidant of Abe Levito. Excellent. Carl Bell got me into an organization called ASIFA. Oh, that's how that came about. Which is the International Animated Film Society. The reason the letters are ASIFA is it was started in France. Yes. <laughs> um, so essentially, Carl put me in touch with this organization and I went to a bunch of screenings of films at Chapman College. One year they had a summer of animation greats. Mm -hmm. And one of them was Oscar Fischinger. Mm -hmm. And Oscar Fischinger did color abstract animation when color film was brand new mm -hmm. in Germany where color film was invented. Right. Um, he did these incredibly wild, essentially stop motion. He called them motion paintings. Mm -hmm. uh, animation to music that were used for as commercials for Philips Radio. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine going to a movie theater in those days, in the 1930s, where you're going to see a, a feature presentation that's in black and white, because then they all were. Right. And seeing this incredible technicolor short with mu synchronized music in front of the movie. Mm -hmm. Must have been unbelievable. Well, Oscar had, was no longer with us, but his widow, uh, Elfrida Fischinger, was still promoting him. Mm -hmm. And there were several students who would come up to his garage studio, actually was a studio in a garage, Mm -hmm. uh, on their house up in uh, up in the Hollywood Hills, and finished some of his motion paintings because he'd storyboarded most of them. So they just went up there and worked on them. Nice. And she gave me a bunch of material from his art collection that included some preliminary work for Fantasia. You know, Disney had a habit of going and looking for the best people he could find for any idea that he had mm -hmm. and he wanted part of Fantasia actually originally all of it to be abstract yes famously this whole thing was going to look like the first sequence wound up looking and the person he went to was Oscar Fischinger mm -hmm. and he worked at the studio for for I think over a year on the project and he developed a synchronization method so that animators could synchronize art to music or dialogue track without having to know how to read music. Ooh. And he, he basically could do this simple notation that you could use. It was almost like time code. It was like handwritten time code. And some of the pieces I got were examples of his timing sheets for some of the animation he did. And I filled an entire display case with the art. And she, when I had my reception for the art show, she showed up. Nice. She came, and it was great because there was a UCLA art student that had heard about the show through the grapevine. He came out, and he saw the Fishinger cabinet and went crazy. Nice. He goes, I could, never believed I could have seen any of this stuff. And I said to him, that's great. Why don't you talk to Elfrida Fischinger? She's standing right here. <laughs> I thought the guy was going to faint. <laughs> <laughs> so how long, uh, you said it was, what, a semester? Or how long did was the art up? The show was up for about two weeks. Oh, okay. It's a short show. 
It was very interesting because I had to hang the show during finals week. Ooh. And, of course, I had all this art, and I didn't want to cut anything out. Mm -hmm. And so I'd met Loring. I hadn't even known he was going to the same school. And I'd run into him like a couple of weeks before. And he came over to help me hang it, just the two of us. Mm. And I told him what I wanted to do, and he started playing around with the pieces of artwork, laying them on the floor in front of the panels. And he said, look, if you arrange them this way, it works. And I was just blown away. So we started hanging the show. And uh, the security guards came and said, we're closing up the building for the night. It's like, great. Oh, okay. We left. So we left and went out somewhere and had dinner. And I said, you know, I've got a key to the gallery. And he said, yeah, but you can't get in the building. I go, the gallery's got a patio. <laughs> Let's go try the key out. <laughs> sure enough, it was the same key. Oh, so we man. walked into the patio, turned all the lights on, and started hanging the show. <laughs> and I, after about an hour, I thought, wait a minute. I'm going to call campus security. So I got on the, the house phone. I called campus security and said, this is to let you know that an art show is being hung in the student union tonight because it's opening tomorrow. So if you see lights on, you'll know why. <laughs> well, thank you for reporting that. <laughs> we didn't get bothered the rest of the night. Nice. So, oh man, I'm getting way ahead of myself here. We already jump into the 70s, and uh, I hadn't finished with 60s TV yet. Um, as I might have kind of indicated there, I was a bit obsessive about TV. You probably should mention the, the reason this is furry is because these are the things that we saw that we were excited about, that we were interested in, mm -hmm. and many of them were animal-based characters. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Some of them to the point of crazy. There was this thing in the late, seven, uh, pardon, late, 70, late 60s called Lancelot Link, which <laughs> it's so hard to explain these days, but it was an entire spoof of... You know, international spy, James Bond type stuff populated entirely by trained chimpanzees. Live action. Actually, they did a remake of that. No kidding. Yep. Oh my, I never saw that. But uh, yeah, that, so, so that caught my eye when I was a kid. Um, and, you know, they, all, all these chimps trained by this one guy. And, um, oh, oh, of course, uh, going right into uh, fursuit stuff, there was the banana splits. Right. Which, you know, in addition to having a bunch of interesting, it was a hosted show. It was the craziest hosted show you've ever seen. And it was mostly about the cartoon shorts, the Hanna-Barbera cartoon shorts that they showed in there. But also there were these sequences with this fursuit band. It was, I think, the first fursuit band out there called the Banana Splits. And... Um, you know, I was already into music back then, so anything that had a band in it, I noticed. That's why Catanooga Cats caught me immediately. The the Banana Splits caught me. Even that uh, DePatty Freeling show, Around the World in 80 Days, which was not very furry at all, but now and then they would go aside into these little sequences, and uh, uh, which uh, featured a band of crickets. And, uh, yeah, speaking of bands, um, you know, Filmation got busy, and uh, they came out with stuff like the Groovy Ghoulies back in the early 70s, which was kind of, it's, it's so hard to explain these days, but it was kind of an animated laugh-in. You know, there was no plots. It was just, you know, characters shouting j jokes back and forth at each other and making lots of really, really silly puns, and then they would interrupt it for a second and... Uh, go to these music sequences with all these strange bands. And again, I was hooked because, you know, they were cool songs and such. You know, being the local yokel, you know, born in redneck country or raised in redneck country that I was, um, you know, my dad got me hooked on all kinds of shows like, um, you know, Mayberry RFD and The Andy Griffith Show and Green Acres and Petticoat Junction and all of those. Uh, so, uh, right towards the end of the 60s, something I was definitely going to notice was the Smokey the Bear show, going back to Toei again, um, which I didn't even realize at the time was Japanese animation because it looked so totally different from, uh, Kimba, the way they, they, they animated was completely different, but, oh my gosh, did that catch my attention, because again, it was entirely animals. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, that was um, an interesting show for me. Of course, I was uh, high school age by the time that was on. What caught me about that show was the writing. Mm-hmm. You really couldn't say the animation was good. It was kind of cheap, limited animation like TV. It was very stiff. But just like Astro Boy and Kimba, not as well written, but they had very interesting concepts for the episodes. And it was very much like Mayberry RFD with Smokey the Bear. Yeah. And it had all the same kind of uh, down-home you know, hick type characters and stories. Yeah, it was a it was a slice of life thing because as I recall, they had villains, but they weren't really tremendously villainous. They were just more sort of jerks. And so it was more the interaction of all these different weird it characters. It was very character driven and it didn't have the, you know, we're a band you know, which is nothing wrong with that, but it didn't have that kind of hook. It didn't have the solving mysteries hook. It didn't have any of those hooks that you would you'd think or you remember or you'd heard about seventies animation. It wasn't a superhero show. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a barbarian show. It wasn't a redo of the Lone Ranger or something like that. Mm-hmm. It wasn't Space Ghost. It wasn't you know. It was just Smokey the Bear in this little you know woodland town. With all of the locals, his, his you know, wisecracking and bumbling assistants, people in town, the, sto- the storekeeper, the school marm, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that really stood out for me. I was, I was never into characters with superpowers. Mm. Um, I watched them. I mean, Chang Lion was really impressed with Samson and Goliath, mm. even though... The show was, you know, even more limited animation and, and stiff. And it was basically a, a lot of these animated shows were actually what a lot of people in the industry call video comic strips. Yeah, I didn't even realize that until I was going back. A lot of the Marvel shows at the time of Iron Man and uh, Fantastic Four and all of those. Spider-Man. Spider-Man yeah. and stuff like that. Just, just you know, literally just pictures. It just pictures and they go from picture to picture. And that's the way television animation, that is animation actually made for television, was. it started out. The mm-hmm. first show, which I remember watching when I was a toddler was crusader rabbit yeah which i didn't even find out about for years that was the first animated television show made for tv Mm -hmm. and it was made by jay ward Mm -hmm. believe it or not famous for later years rocky and bullwinkle yep we should definitely uh make a thing now is it the thing that i found is i remember jay ward had no intention of being an animator he was just looking to get into the media but he found an in that way yeah well the thing is is that the tv uh networks needed to fill when when television became almost 24 hours i mean most of these stations would go off the air late at night Mm-hmm. Like after midnight, they'd go off the air f- and, and come back on the mo- in the morning at like 5 or 6 in the morning. Right. But they had to fill every day all those hours, mm-hmm. which is why you had so many reruns of old movies. And the hosted cartoon show, which a lot of young furs probably aren't even aware of. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were still a couple of them around, I think, in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And there were some similar style shows. They were style parodies. Yes, exactly. Um, what was it? Pee Wee's Playhouse? Yep. Things like that. Captain Croc. Basically, studios would get the rights to show animation, theatrical animation, from even from Europe or even from Japan. It would be dubbed usually poorly. Mm-hmm. And they'd have a, basically a, a, a whole, you know, Walls and walls of 16-millimeter cartoons. To tie them together, they would have a kid show host. Uh, Some of them were inane. Some of them were pretty cool. Yep. Bozo the Clown. Yeah. Local celebrity. Uh, Another local celebrity from uh, L.A. who most people won't remember is Hobo Kelly. Yeah. Who was this lady who uh, 
did you know weird slapstick humor and then in between in between showing cartoons yeah she was kind of riffing kind of a female version of uh, Matt Kelly one of the most famous clowns in the world who became almost synonymous he was like the first famous television clown almost like a Charlie Chaplin-esque character right exactly and eventually those hosted cartoon shows became the cartoon variety shows of the 60s, like Banana Splits, where you didn't have a live host, or you didn't have a host that would film like five or six shows a week and then come back and do five or six shows. Basically, they made sequences of the Banana Splits kind of like short cartoons. Mm-hmm. And they would put those sequences between other short cartoons. And they could come up with, you know, I guess throw ideas into a hat, draw them out, do six episodes of that one particular idea, and then do a totally different one. They didn't have to worry about content consistency because the hosts just showed all kinds of different stuff. And interestingly enough, Catanooga Cats was kind of a hybrid where the Catanooga Cats were the sequences between the other cartoons. So it was a hosted show that had kind of regressed into an animated hosted show. (laughs) Self-referential there, yeah. I mean, Warner Brothers did their own thing with the Bugs Bunny show. Mm -hmm, Exactly. And the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner Hour, you know, all the iterations of that, where they took theatrical cartoons and unfortunately usually hacked into pieces for time yes. limitations, and then have little sequences in between. Yeah. It's uh, funny. I remember uh, Chuck Jones mentioning that, you know, how much they struggled sometimes to fit all of their ideas into a six-minute cartoon, and then they wind up on TV as five or four minutes, you know? <laughs> so. Right. A lot of times they would cut stuff out. There was actually some censorship. There was actually uh, a lot of the characters having things explode in their face. Mm-hmm. It got to a point where they were cutting things like that out, which made the cartoons really hard to understand. They just didn't make any sense. Yep. But certainly I was attracted immediately from, you know, a child to anything with animal characters. So Crusader Rabbit and then one I liked even more, Rough and Ready which was Hanna-Barbera's first animated show on television. Should be pointed out that they were already famous at that point for the Tom and Jerry cartoons, which which were theatrical and animated in a much different style. When MGM closed the animation studio, they put together Rough and Ready and pitched it. And after severe negotiations and cutting and cutting and cutting the price per episode, they finally got it on television. And it was interesting because although you had the the big, not-so-smart character and the little smart character, they were friends, and they basically went on adventures together, which, according to uh, Jack Hanna, I think that was his name, wasn't it? Yeah, Jack Hanna, William Barbera. According to Mr. Hanna, this was a departure from them because since they had they didn't have all the the budget to do the huge scope with all the crazy action scenes that Tom and Jerry was famous for, they could actually get away with the characters being talking heads and kind of working off each other like Abbott and Costello. Well, that's the thing is, you know, uh, these days uh, among people who even remember Hanna-Barbera, uh, they're kind of considered to be, you know, the height of cheap, stiff TV animation. But what I remember back from the early days was stuff like Yogi Bear and Huckleberry Hound and all that, is they were funny. Yeah, the writing. Well, not even the, just the writing, but the writing definitely, but but the editing. They had a, a, a timing for timing of doing a, a, a quick cut in a way that was just tremendously funny and, and sound effects. You know, they they put together stuff that was just, for for as limited as it was, was amazingly funny. It's it's very similar to, um, of course, uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle and the other Jay Ward stuff, which was, you know, stiff as a board and hardly moved, but from the writing was just, you know, phenomenal. Yeah, that's the thing. 
Jay Ward was interesting. He was one of those people who, like, he was almost like um, a person who wanted to be in television in the worst way. <laughs> the guy was just crazy. Just, there's a really funny record album that was put out, I think, in the 80s. That was just a co collection of audio clips from J. Ward projects, mm -hmm. including a lot of musical numbers that Bill Scott and June Foray did voices on and stuff. But it was just, I think it was something that was sold at the Bullwinkle Emporium when it existed. But the guy was just insane. And he didn't write everything. He hired good TV writers to write the stuff. And they were well aware that the animation was really substandard. Right. But it didn't matter. It was done by a little outfit down in Mexico, of oh, all places. It's crazy. It's like they were farming out even shows like that. <laughs> in 1967. So also in the late 60s, I was there sitting at a friend's house, and I, I have recollections of my parents kind of herding me into the living room and sitting me down and saying, here, you need to see this. It was the premiere of a new show called Sesame Street which, weirdly enough, did not have the uh, famous Sunny Day, Sleep in the Clouds a Day song when it started. It, I remember it very clearly. It was just a bunch of spinning blocks in a black space. And one by one, they would stop until they spelled out Sesame Street. And then it cut to, you know, the famous street scene and all that. And right off the bat, we're meeting characters like like Big Bird, and Kermit was there. Kermit uh, didn't start with Sesame Street. A lot of people don't realize that, but Kermit was actually invented by Jim Henson for uh, the Jimmy Dean show. He was one of the backup characters because uh, one of the backup sequences was uh, Jim Henson's puppets um, on the Jimmy Dean show, So, and, uh, and also uh, commercials. Uh, so Kermit was already somewhat a known commodity when he showed up on Sesame Street, but no one had ever seen Big Bird before or Cookie Monster, or Oscar the Grouch, or all of these people. So, I mean, just, whoa! And, you know, it's funny, similar to, to, to Jay Ward, um, what I mentioned about him, Jim Henson was another guy, he wound up somewhere he never planned to be. When he was, you know, a young man, what he really wanted to do was make avant-garde films. And he, you know, and he made several of them when he was going through college and was, and some of them are, are really, you know, well known and popular these days. But puppetry was just something he did as an experiment uh, one time as another way to make to make interesting films and see what he could do on film. Which is why many of his puppets are his most interesting puppets are not characters; they're often just things that move, kind of like a mime type situation. And um, then he discovered that his puppets could actually make a living, so that's why he stuck with that. So I don't know who it was at the Children's Television Workshop who decided to hire this guy to uh, be the puppeteer for uh, this new show they were trying out, which was a totally new concept in educational television called Sesame Street. But uh, thank goodness that he did, because, I mean, where would Sesame Street be without them? Can you remember much about the first episodes? Which characters were there then? Oh, my. Uh, pretty much all of them. I think in the very first episode, we met Big Bird. We met Oscar. Um, those were easy because they were on the street with, you know, with the main, with the main human characters. Uh, Gordon and Susan and Bob and several of the others. Um, then uh, I know in the first episode, we had the first episode of Bert and Ernie. And uh, I know we had some sequences with, uh, we, we had some sequences with Cookie Monster and I know we had some sequences with Kermit. I don't know if Grover was in the very first, but if he was in one of the first, if not the first, um, he came on pretty soon. So that was kind of the, that was kind of the big set. Oh, and Harry the Monster, who a lot of people don't don't remember these days because he never got quite as famous as some of the others. But uh, you you'd know him if you saw him. But uh, you know characters like uh, Snuffleupagus. Uh, didn't come along until later, and Elmo didn't come along until much, much later. He was, he was a very late in the uh, in the Sesame Street thing. But uh, Big Bird was there from the start, and like I said, Kermit, Oscar, Cookie Monster, Bert and Ernie. Um, so, yeah, they were off and running. It's interesting. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the advance that 
Jim Henson brought to puppeteering couldn't have existed back when in the early days, you know, medieval times when you had Punch and Judy shows or Victorian era, was the feedback of television that the puppeteers had a monitor below where they worked Mm -hmm. that showed visually, basically showed what was coming off the camera. So they could actually see the puppets acting from the audience's point of view. It's a totally different concept. And it didn't matter that the puppets were so simple. They actually seemed to be paying attention to the audience because of the view the puppeteers got. Yep. Which is why you get things that you had never seen before where a, a puppet character could act just by kind of tilting his head up or down, you know, to, to, to match his mood and stuff like that, that, you know, Henson invented that. And that was, you know, if, if they're the most famous puppets in the world, that's a large part of it. And, of course, for, for people who don't know, they're called Muppets because um, they are a combination of marionettes and puppets, which is why you wind up with these characters that can, you know, not only really control their mouth movements and stuff like that, but they can also move their arms. Yeah, the arms were, were moved usually with sticks. Right, exactly. You know, amazing the lifelike effect you get that way. And, uh, of course, in modern furry days, we have the Paw Pet shows, both the television, you know, the, the online TV show, and the incredibly advanced and dramatic high production shows they put on at Euroference every year which are kind of like mini movies. Mm-hmm. And once again, those are all worked with the vi- video feedback. Mm-hmm. They actually have monitors underneath the work stages so people can see the puppets from the audience's point of view. I'm jumping ahead decades here, but uh, we recently saw a presentation by some of the guys who put on an awesome t- uh, TV puppet series called uh, Mongrels. In, in Europe, and I remember them talking at one point about the interesting thing of some peop- some of the puppeteers prefer to have the video feed flipped left to right so that they're seeing you know when right. they turn it when they turn the character right it moves right on the on the screen and some prefer to have it the same way because they're used to reversing it in their head and since they don't all do it the same way <laughs> it gets very confusing for them sometimes when they wind up with especially if you wind up with someone else's monitor. Oh, at least that's an easy thing to do these days. Yes, it is. Uh, so, but but that was just one of those little you never thought of things that way. So, um, oh yeah, uh, we 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 touch briefly on uh, Sid and Marty Croft. We shouldn't get away from the '60s without talking about the oddness known as H.R. Puffin stuff. Yet another set of things that everyone thought these guys were on drugs, but again, they didn't need drugs at all. They were perfectly crazy enough to come up with it by themselves. I think they were drugs. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, you know, uh, to talk about your fursuit influences, uh, the designs on, uh, on I mean, I, I for years saw H.R. Puff and stuff and never figured out that he was supposed to be a dragon because that's the weirdest design for a dragon that you've ever seen in your life. But I didn't care. He was just awesome. But he was surrounded by all these other, you know, sometimes animals and sometimes just weirdnesses. And, of course, yet, yet again, more song sequences and... Uh, like every other kid in America I, and halfway around the world, I fell in love with Witchy Poo. She's an awesome villain who, again, was, was, was villainous, but you never, you never hated her and you never scared of her because she was just too cool. <laughs> yeah, I watched um, Puff and Stuff when it was on, and I thought the, the writing was pretty clever. They, they slipped by some pretty heavy advice, mm-hmm. you know, heavy, heavy... Uh, opinion and they were very topical sometimes Mm -hmm. they had uh, more than one episode that was kind of riffing the war at the time and i don't think little kids would have gotten it i sure didn't but but uh it was sure pretty obvious to me anyway i like shows like uh the bugaloos because i thought the characters were so damn sexy yes and of course band once again so i noticed that because again we were doing music and um then <laughs> you talk about your anthropomorphic eventually he would do a show uh, the, the the sid and marty would do a show about anthropomorphic hats yes 
Lidsville. Lidsville, right. exactly. I mean, how d- d- proving that anthropomorphics is a broad umbrella, of whether you can't get more broad than that. So, yeah, like I said, coming fast and furious, folks, this is all the stuff that I had plowing through my head just off TV before I even went to go see movies um, in, in, in the late 60s and early 70s. So, uh, yeah, I, I had my share of animation. I had my share of uh, fantasy TV. And I was one of those kids that this is a common, common thread you see through a lot of fandom. I was more into the media world than I was into the world I lived in. I considered uh, Yogi Bear and uh, H.R. Puff and stuff and uh, Grover and some people like that to be closer friends to me, even though, uh, even more so than the people I went to school with. Because, of course, they talked to you. And so that's that, that was the environment that was in my head. So as I said earlier, jumping ahead just a little bit, Da 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 da, Robin Hood. I had no idea what I was in for. Um, I mean, other than the TV, you know, I was already, you know, if, if it's furry, I grabs my nose, I notice it. Um, so I had noticed the TV uh, commercials, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to see this. So we somehow talked my dad into actually going to a sit down theater, getting rid of his claustrophobia for a little bit, and. I had never seen anything like that. Um, it was Disney's first film that was entirely animal characters. There were no humans in it. And the characters were just... The, the characters are 90% of what is awesome about that movie. Most people don't realize these days that among the uh, literati of uh, animation, that's considered to be a rather bad movie. That it had some, you know, problems with the editing. The continuity wasn't great. They they reused and traced over a lot of previous animation from other movies, which was not an uncommon practice by any means. But they traced over movies that they had had out like three years prior, <laughs> so it made it real obvious to anyone who had any memory at all. Hey, you guys are are cheating there. So. A lot of the animation uh, fans consider that to be kind of low-grade Disney. But the characters and the acting were just phenomenal for the time. I mean, you know, and so many, uh, you know, uh, so many different species coming at you. So, yeah, we, 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 we fell in love with, uh, with those characters. And uh, I started, I, I had no idea at the time what it would mean, but it, it probably was pointing at my uh, eventual discovery of my bisexuality, the fact that uh, I simultaneously fell in love with Robin Hood and Maid Marian. <laughs> yeah, I had similar reactions to some shows, I uh, remember. Interestingly enough... The reason that shows like movies like Robin Hood and Aristocats and shows of that movies of that period were considered poor quality, as, as I was pointing out earlier tonight when I was talking to Changa at dinner, the um, Disney company back then really wanted to shut animation down. Yeah, they had made a lot of money. People don't realize this. They're live action films. They're live action comedies and dramas and stuff. Uh, family films were making buckets of money and didn't cost anywhere near as much as animation did. And, you know, so even back in the 50s, there was a lot of pressure on Walt to shut animation down. And he, it's one of the things that he, he can be credited for. A lot of people, you know, no, Walt didn't draw the characters. No, he didn't do the voices. No, he didn't write the, sh- the movies. You know, he used to say he was like a little bee who went from place to place and kind of pollinated the whole project. Mm-hmm. One of the things that he basically stood up and said, no, we're not going to stop doing animation. It's what made us famous. And I think what happened is after Walt died... Even though they did, he never got his replacement in place like he wanted to. Mm-hmm. The studio just had so much momentum at that point, and it's like we can't let Walt down. You know, we have to. You know, his legacy. We his legacy has to continue. So they kept making films, and it kind of went downhill, and it's kind of sad. But the product, you look at it, and you're not gonna you're not gonna compare it. If you're not gonna compare it to something made in the '30s, it was amazing. And, you know, even with the budget they had to work with, they got great voice people. 
the animators were great actors. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it produced some pretty amazing things. And, of course, like you said, all animals. Yeah. Although, of course, there weren't any humans actually on the screen in Bambi. True, true. But they but are you knew they were around. To. Yes, yes, they were referred to specifically as such. And we probably should mention real quick that uh, one of the things that came along that allowed for a lot of that was xerography. Yeah. Um, suddenly you could, you know, z- someone came up with the bright idea of using Xerox machines to ink. And suddenly it became a lot easier to do animated cells than it had been in the past. And that allowed the films to be made a lot faster and a lot cheaper. Quick. What was the first theatrical produ- production that Disney made that used xerography? Was it 101 Dalmatians? Didn't have to be a feature. Oh, I don't know. Goliath the Second. <laughs> okay. Which was a featurette. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so interesting, what, what made 1973 so interesting to me was, um, you know, kind of a collusion uh, for furry stuff then. We had uh, Robin Hood come out, and almost simultaneously, we had Charlotte's Web, which uh, was interesting because our teacher had read E.B. White's book to us earlier in that year, and then suddenly here comes Hanna-Barbera with this movie version. So it was like, you know, wow, what timing. And uh, that was probably, I think, what most people consider, you know, the Hanna-Barbera Studios high point. Yeah. I had the story read to me uh, when I was in, I think, third grade, many years before. And when the movie was announced, I kind of went, Hanna-Barbera? And I looked at the cast and go, that's a pretty nice cast, though. Mm -hmm. And I went and saw it, and I go, wow, the Sherman Brothers? Yes. Uh, And it was like, I used to tell people, um, I I was kind of an animation advocate, almost a pusher. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a lot of friends who weren't into animation. They just weren't into animation. Yes. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, well, My Little Pony's for little girls. It's like animation is for kids. Mm-hmm. And I go, no, it's not. Mm-hmm. It's a medium. It's a way of making films. Mm-hmm. And one of my friends that I met because uh, he bought a pair of my very, very first speakers was a musician. And I said, you have really got to see Charlotte's Web. You like the story. And it's very good. And he didn't believe me. But it was in the theaters, and he finally went and saw it one time. I, we didn't go together, but he came, you know, the next time I saw him, he goes, Wow, that was a great movie. You were right. Mm-hmm. That was great. And I used to remember telling people it was a story that was so good that even Hanna Barbera couldn't ruin it. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, well, you couldn't. You couldn't. I love the fact that the uh, movie actually begins with the first sentence of the actual book and ends with the actual last sentence of the book. You know, you just can't top that story. And it was very daring at the time because, you know, if you're if you're not familiar with the story, it's about death. Well, it's not just about death. It's about death and remembrance. Yes. It's about people supporting other people. Mm-hmm. People must a lot of times mistake children's literature, children's films, children's books for basically a babysitter, brainless babysitters to mm-hmm. to keep kids interested. Good children's literature isn't anything like that. You know, if you you know didn't grow up with Doctor Zeus, if you didn't read things like Charlotte's Web or The Secret of Nim. You're missing out. Don't think you can't read it now. Absolutely. Don't think you can't. I mean, I recently got the uh, Audible um, audiobooks has a series, uh, a new series of children's literature that they're doing with new readers, and they recently released Secret of Nim. And although I knew about the book, I hadn't actually ever read it. Oh. So. I just listened to it last year, and it was amazing. Uh, you know, it's like currently one of my favorite 
children's book authors, or I'd say young readers authors, is Tora Seedler. You know, I originally read Wainscot Weasel because it had a weasel in it. Of course. I'm a weasel fanatic. And even though the story took some turns I wasn't expecting, I loved it. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. And you look online, and the reviews are incredible. And the reviews aren't just from children. And then I read Rat's Tale, and that was amazing. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because currently um, Kitty, Sari, has just discovered my copy of A Rat's Tale and started reading it. And he said the other night, he goes, wow, this is really compelling. I can't put it down. <laughs> Yeah, uh, my my mother read uh, Secret, uh, uh, yeah, Secret of Nim to me. Uh, no, pardon me, Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. Yes. Um, back. Um, yes, I'm sorry. That's the title of the book. Yes. Uh, not we're not talking about the movie here. Yes. Um, she read that to me back in the early '70s, and I immediately fell in love with that. Um, so yeah. As you are hearing among our things here, folks, you can tell that there was an awful lot going on in both of our heads back in the late 60s and early 70s, and we barely made it halfway into the 70s here, and we're both already actively collecting on stuff. In the second half of the 70s, um, this thing known as fandom started getting involved with our lives, and uh, we will get heavily into that in our next thrilling episode um, so until then, from the beautiful Prancing Skill Tear in Garden Grove, California, on February 12th, 2015, I am Rod O'Reilly. And I'm Mark Merlino. And so once again, from TOFF, TTFN. Oh, no.